speaker, I would like to talk about presumably the ultimate part of cell respiration wherein we finally get our ATP, and this is called the electron transport chain. Now, this is one of those pathways which I think, like probably the pentose phosphate pathway or the Krebs cycle, uh, we could correlate a lot of uh, many far fetched uh, but interesting trivia, but I think for the purpose of uh, what I want to deliver here, I would just uh, stick to the mere essentials of trying to discuss how we ultimately get ATP from this pathway. So just take note of that. So, before we start, I would uh, like to mention that, again, the ATC is like the terminal part of respiration. So, of course, we must first reflect and recall what were the steps before this. And to answer that, well, actually, if you want to really go from the very, very, very start, it was uh, glycolysis. However, I cannot write glycolysis here because glycolysis is not actually uh, done in the matrix and I've discussed it elsewhere. So just imagine that glycolysis has converted glucose to pyruvate, that which we should already know at this point. And then pyruvate enters the mitochondrial matrix. So maybe this is what I could write here. And then pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA. And then the acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. All of that happens here, so I'm writing at the correct place. And then after TCA, we, we actually produce stuff like the reduced NAD or NADH and reduced fat or fat H. This is actually what we stopped with so far in the TCA cycle. So now, the question is, again, I have always been mentioning it since the very start of metabolism. I know that NADH will ultimately become ATP as well as fat H, but how? And the answer to the question, how? Is this entire thing you're looking at here. So, let's deal with the details. Now, as the word electron transport chain implies, the idea here is that if you follow this blue uh, colored stuff here, there is a continuous chain or flow of electrons from one point to another. And that, uh, that series of locations where the electrons flow from one place to another are the so-called respiratory complexes or ETC complexes. In the simplest way, you could just label them based on their number. So we have complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. They actually have here also the uh, common names of these. So complex 1 is usually called NADH dehydrogenase. Then 2 is succinate dehydrogenase. 3 is cytochrome C reductase or cytochrome reductase. And 4 is cytochrome oxidase. Do note that these other uh, these names are actually simplified versions, and if you find uh, uh, or if you search for for other references, you may find even more complicated names for that. But uh, that's the reason why we just stick with the simple numbers here. So we just have complex one, two, three, four. Now, out of the four complexes, you will all, uh, actually notice here that the way I drew them, complexes one, three, and four are embedded in the inner membrane. So just to remind you of the anatomy or the, the, the infrastructure of the mitochondrion, the inner membrane is this one. Okay, So you could say that um, to the outside face or facing outside of the inner membrane is the so-called intermembrane space or IMS. So basically this entire region right here at the top is the IMS. So this is the inner membrane. And then to the inside of the inner membrane is the matrix, like so. So this thing at the bottom is what you can imagine is the matrix. So it's as if I zoom this entire region here to the entire screen you are looking at. So uh, again, you see 1, 3, and 4 are embedded in the inner membrane. And that is because later, these will act as pumps. So some kind of passage for something. But two is not, and they are just designed that way. And also, take note, the way we call them as quote-unquote complexes mean that once you try to search for the composition of complex two, for example, it's not just one enzyme or one molecule. It's an ensemble or it's like a combination of many different molecules that basically facilitate the electron transfer. But I don't want to discuss each detail or each component just to make my discussion more brief. Okay, so let us go to our starting points first. As you see, we have here NADH and FADH. And uh, as you see also, NADH in the electron transport chain will be converted to NAD 
fat age will be converted to fat. Now, if I ask you, do you consider this as oxidation or reduction? Of course, since here we see the loss of hydrogens, dehydrogenation, that is also the same as oxidation. So you can clearly see that the first part of the electron transport chain involves the oxidation of our cofactors NADH and FADH. Okay? That is why we justify the name oxidative phosphorylation because oxidation is literally the thing which starts everything. And phosphorylation alludes to the fact or suggests the fact that we phosphorylate ADP to generate ATP, which is, well, in the first place, our ultimate goal. Okay? So, let's uh, deal with this in a sequential way, in an orderly way. So, let's first imagine uh, focusing our eyes on NAD. Maybe we could use, what color can we use? Maybe orange would do. So, NADH is first oxidized to NAD. Now, in this oxidation process, there's actually the transmittal of electrons to the different parts of complex 1. And the moment that these electrons flow from one part of complex 1 to another, and so on and so forth, generates energy. Now, the electrons will uh, eventually exit complex 1 and then enter complex 2. And once again, there are many components of uh, complex 2 passing around the electrons until they exit and then travel to complex 3. And then moving from one part to another until it exits complex 3 and eventually arrives at complex 4. Now, complex 4 is the last complex uh, that facilitates these series of transfers. And it so happens that in the case of aerobic respiration, for example, in us humans, the last component, I did mention again that each complex has many parts. Well, in complex 4, one of the parts, and actually the last part, or what we can call as the final electron acceptor, is oxygen. Literally, the oxygen we breathe. And once the electrons hit oxygen, there will be a reduction process converting one molecule of oxygen to two molecules of water. Okay. Actually, it so happens that you just consume half of an oxygen molecule for every reduced cofactor. So it's as if I'm saying that one oxygen is to two molecules of NAD or two molecules of FAD. Okay. Now anyway, um, since I've already written oxygen as one oxygen here, I'll just keep it like that. So now, what else should we know about this phenomenon? At this moment, it should already be clear to us that the way we call a transport chain, it's because there's basically a continuous transport of electrons from complex to complex. I did mention also a while ago that the movement of electrons from complex to complex would generate energy. Apparently, that energy may be enough to change the structure of these proteins in complex 1 and open it as if it was a pump. If you open this, it will actually allow protons or hydrogen ions from inside the matrix, so basically this bottom part here, to go out into the inner intermembrane space. So, in the case of complex 1, the total amount of computed protons released per NADH is 4. Okay? And as long as electrons go from one complex to another, they will keep an opening these pumps, including complex 3 and complex 4. It so happens for complex 3, you release 4 protons, well, just like complex 1, and for complex 4, you instead release 2 of them. Okay. Now, for the case of FAD, it doesn't uh, face the exact same fate because instead of entering through complex 1 like NADH, FADH instead enters complex 2. But the rest of the story is the same. Wherein, the moment that FADH enters complex 2, the electrons move around and get passed from one component to another, then goes to 3, and then goes to 4. So technically, the only thing that differentiates the journey of these two is that NADH goes to complex 1, FADH does not, because it enters complex 2. That would matter later for some uh, simple computation. Now, the idea here is that since the protons from the matrix... So imagine there are, there are a lot here, but they are now being pumped out of the intermembrane space. We can kind of assume that there is 
already many hydrogen ions at the outside once the electron transport chain is going on, and there are few protons on the inside. Since there is a difference between these two areas, there's an area of high proton concentration, and there's an area of low proton concentration, there is now what you call a proton gradient. And one thing that we should have learned about gradients is that eventually gradients are supposed to dissipate because we want to reach equilibrium. In other words, whenever we face a circumstance where there's one area with a lot of something and one area with few of that thing, we want to eventually reach the point wherein we lose the, uh, we lose the components okay, of the area with a lot of those things and then the ones the area with the few uh, things would have an increase so that balance would be achieved at the end which would require this one gaining back the things that's present in the area with a lot of those things in other words putting that in the language of protons eventually we want these protons to go back to our matrix apparently complex one three and four are only one way uh, tickets so to speak because the protons may exit 1 or 3 or 4, but they cannot go back using the same things. It so happens that there is one uh, protein that could do that, and that is actually what we often call as complex 5, otherwise known as ATP synthase. Thus, this is like the solution to the dilemma a while ago that if you want to dissipate or to solve the proton gradient, but cannot go back using these uh, three complexes, the answer lies in this fifth complex. So we now assume that these could go back here, and then when they go back, equilibrium is achieved, the proton gradient is gradually removed, and the catch here is that since the name of complex 5 is ATP synthase, it's worthwhile to note that this one does create ATP. And you know what? It will do that at the expense of four protons per molecule of ATP. So where are we going with this? We are going with the idea that the actual reason for the drama a while ago, you can think of like the, uh, the, the pumping out of the proton as some kind of drama. We needed that because it's actually these same protons that are required by our ATP producing protein. And once these go back here, you're like hitting two birds with one stone. One, you're, resolver, you're, you're resolving a problem you made a while ago, which is the proton gradient. And number two, you are now finally achieving your ultimate goal, which is to make ATP. It's as if we use the proton as a bridge between two coupled processes. Remember, a while ago, the only thing that happened at the start is the oxidation of these two things. Then, of course, uh, all, all of a sudden, we make ATP. And how did that even happen? We used the protons to connect the processes. We used them to connect, one, the oxidation of these two factors, and two, the generation of ATP. That's why you can think of the electron transport chain as not just one step, but two steps. Or maybe, to be more accurate, you can think of electron transport chain as just the first step of the generation of ATP. Wherein, once this electron transport chain succeeds in making the proton gradient, complex 5 will fulfill the second step, and all of this is actually the more accurate way of depicting the entire oxidative phosphorylation process. But uh, many references uh, interchange these two terms, and uh, it really depends on how uh, we use it for discussion. But do note that they overlap at some points, but not exactly the same. So yeah. So uh, I, I, I am so far done with explaining how our NADH and FADH could give us ATP. But now, as one last note, maybe it's a nice thing to do a little computation. Recall, isn't it that I told you that NADH and FADH um, compens... Uh, uh, what's the proper word? NADH and FADH are equivalent to a fixed amount of ATP, right? And maybe by looking at the details here, we could arrive with an explanation 
why NADH, as uh, I have been mentioning this all, it all, the, all the time so far, is equivalent to 2.5 moles of ATP, and FADH is 1.5. Especially some people may have asked, why did we get a 0.5? Is there such a thing as half an ATP? Well, the reality is there is none. But if you understand where we derive the computations, you may agree to these numbers. So, let me just clear some space here at the bottom. Let's do the computations here. So, remember, a while ago, I did mention that NADH will enter complex 1 and will allow the pumping out of 4 protons, but then go to 3 and allow the pumping of 4 protons more, and then go to complex 4 and allow the pumping of 2 more protons. If you add all of that, 4 plus 4 plus 2, that's as if for every NADH, um, the electrons that go through the ETC will allow the release of 10 protons. But for FADH, since it enters complex 2, it will only allow the pumping out of the protons from 3 and 4. So 4 plus 2, that's only 6 protons. Okay, So what does this have to do with the difference in the uh, ATP that uh, NADH is 2.5 and FADH is 1.5? Let's do a little dimensional analysis. I stated a while ago that our ATP synthase here makes one ATP for every four protons. So maybe we could, uh, uh, how could they compute this? Um, let's see. Uh, I have your 10 protons for every NADH. I want to cancel out the proton units. So maybe I could put this at the denominator. So that's four protons. Yeah, if I do this, I will cancel these units, and then 1 ATP is the unit on top. So, if I do make this computation, my unit at the end would be ATP per NADH, right? And uh, 10 divided by 4, guess what? Is 2.5. And doesn't that mean that, doesn't that, mean that I can make 2.5 molecules of ATP per NADH? That's right. Whatever we saw here, the protons here, were actually used to synthesize ATP, which, by the computation we did here, is the reason why we're memorizing the value 2.5. Or for example, since I know I could produce 6 protons for every fat H, and I multiply that with a constant conversion unit here, um, for every 1 ATP, I need 4 protons. Then, cancelling this, 6 divided by 4, voila, we have... 1.5 molecules of ATP generated per FADH. And I do hope that you realize that, you know, even though it's easy to memorize 2.5 and 1.5, knowing the reason why they are 2.5 and 1.5 is way cooler than just memorizing it. Well, at least in my personal opinion.